Racism in High School Competitive Swimming, presented by Maxine Aguilar. During the Great Migration, Chicago received over 500,000 of the 7 million African Americans who migrated north. Between 1900 and 1920, 13,000 of these migrants were school-aged African Americans. Events Because of the population boom, Wendell Phillips High School desperately needed a new high school building to house the increase. Wendell Phillips High School was known for its composition of middle-class white students with a small number of blacks. But by 1918, black students became 56% of the student body, a direct result of the Great Migration. In 1929, the Chicago Board of Education voted to construct a new facility at 49th and Wabash. The estimated construction cost was two and a half million dollars. The completion was thought to be by 1932, but due to the Great Depression, funding issues caused a suspension of construction until 1934. The school's opening and dedication ceremony was finally held in February of 1935. This school was initially named the New Wendell Phillips, but was changed to John Baptiste Dusable. The Dusable High School had a capacity for 2,664 students. It maintains a large gymnasium for boys, two smaller gyms for girls, an auxiliary co-ed gym, a 20-yard swimming pool, a large auditorium for 2,500 seats, and a variety of laboratories that include a botany lab and print shop. Ideas DuSable's swim team began competing during the 1935-1936 school year. The seahorse was the mascot for the swim team in the 1930s, but currently the panther embodies DuSable's mascot symbol. During the first year of com competition, the seahorses initially competed with extracurricular teams, such as the YMCA and the Boys Club. Because white high school teams did not want to compete with black swimmers, in 1948, the Colored Intercollegiate Athletic Association hosted an annual tournament that attracted Negro colleges in the East from border states of Illinois. They drew swimmers both from DuSable Swim Program and from black high schools in Washington, D.C. in the state of Maryland. DuSable's success in swimming began with an undefeated dual meet season with a winning streak of 53 dual meet victories that lasted until 1943. DuSable was the only black high school swim team that existed during this time in Chicago. DuSable swam against only two black swim teams from Gary. All other schools that competed against DuSable were predominantly white high schools. On many occasions, white students, their coaches, and swimming officials expressed racist views around the black swimmers' participation. Active racist practices in the Chicago Public League schools brought the issue of DuSable's all-black swim team's participation in competition with other schools to a high point in November 1941. While some coaches from the protesting schools had previously conducted dual meet competitions with DuSable, others had not, and would not allow DuSable into the newly formed league. The Chicago Defender reported, There have been rumors that although DuSable will invite teams to their tanks, Few invitations to go to other schools in Chicago will be extended to them. The crux of the whole thing is that these coaches, not the boys, don't want competition against Negro swimmers. One of the most outspoken coaches against Tusabal was from the Inglewood community. Ironically, this coach led an all-white high school team that was actually 60% black. A few weeks later, the Chicago Board of Education ended the Lily White Swim League as featured in the Chicago Defender's headline. This flare-up offered a clear view of the trials DuSable faced each year up to this point for its burgeoning swim team. DuSable faced its competition with spirited rivalry against the school teams it faced. In February of 1943, the team beat Harrison High School 42-24 for its 53rd straight dual meet win. A few days after the meet, Coach Mackey was drafted to serve in the United States Army and left his post as coach of the DuSable Sea Forces. No additional reports of dual meets were reported. Overt racism experienced by African American swim team members from the earlier years no longer displayed obvious incident. No published reports of resistance from the schools that previously refused to compete with black teams were as evident. 
Champion breaststroker Donald Clark recalled, I can honestly say that with regard to the guys we competed against, we never had any racial incidents that I can recall. In fact, back then I received a lot of compliments from my fellow competitors. I was even spurred on by a lot of fellows on the white teams. Edward Kirk, another team member, recalled Coach Mackey's positive attitude and focus. He did not allow his fellow white coaches to influence his team's skill building and competing. People. For the 1945-46 season, Coach Mackey returned to DuSable for the following spring. At the citywide championship meet, Kirk became the third DuSable individual winner when he won the 200 freestyle. During the 1949-1950 school year, Edward Kirk earned first place in the 150-yard individual medley with a record-breaking time of 1 minute and 42.7 seconds. When Ed Kirk retired to Florida 15 years ago, he not only wanted to live near the water, he wanted to be in it all the time. It's part of me. It's past the love state. It's just... It's in my bones, it's in my head, in my body. Something he discovered as a kid swimming in a segregated Chicago public pool before the civil rights movement. I went into the pool, I saw all these people swimming, I said, wow, that's look like fun. In 1950, Ed became the first African-American high school swimming champion in Illinois, competing against and beating white swimmers. I was really proud. But it was an outcome white coaches tried to prevent. I didn't pay that any mind. The white swimmers protested, telling their coaches if Ed wasn't allowed to swim, they wouldn't compete either. And I appreciate him and thank him for it. Kirk was the first documented interscholastic all-American swimmer of African descent in 1950. Record-setting triumphs like these were wins white officials often attempted to thwart. Once, a white official sought to disqualify Kirk with accusation of a one-touch finish, an event that requires swimmers to finish with a two-handed touch. Thankfully, Kirk recalled, an Olympic swimmer present in the audience stood up by threatening the official because the minority swimmers were not treated fairly. During his tenure at DuSable, Kirk became team captain. He encouraged his teammates to join him at the Wabash YMCA three times a week, where he worked part-time. As dedicated sportsmen, he and his teammates practiced over Christmas break every day, reaping the benefit of extra practice. Additionally, Kirk coached unofficially, assisting other swimmers with their skills. Today, the impact of racism in competitive swimming is demonstrated in subtlety. Though less obvious than the 1940s and 50s, resources continue to limit the progress of minorities in the sport. According to the NCAA for the 2005-2006 academic year, 107 African American swimmers competed in Division I, only 1.2% 1 of the 8,500 total. Richard Lapchick, a commentator on diversity in sports, remarked, Swimming, like golf and tennis, has been considered a country club sport. To date, it has not produced a Tiger Woods or a Venus and Serena Williams. Until that happens, it's likely the swimming pool will remain a frontier for African American athletes. Blair Cross, the only black female swimmer on the University of Maryland team, understands this predicament. People commented when she identified herself as a swimmer. She revealed, I am a role model for other young African American girls. Greater presence in the sport continues to evolve on a national level. Anthony Irvin became the first African American to win gold at the Sydney Games in 2000. Cullen Jones also won gold in the 2008 Olympics alongside his teammate Michael Phelps. As fresher crops of swimmers like Blair Cross and Colin Jones take national stage, the competitors will reflect the American melting pot. This visibility pays homage to the pioneers like Eddie Kirk and Donald Clark, who can be proud of their contribution because their commitment paved the way.